Our scripture reading today is from the sixth chapter of the book of Mark. So listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere, except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there, except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages, teaching. He called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick. No bread, no bags, and no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but not to put on two shirts. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you, as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm a little ashamed to admit this in case there are any teachers or engineers or scientists out there, but I struggled through high school math. I took the typical physics, calculus, algebra one and two, geometry, I tried to learn how to write proofs and had to learn how to use a graphing calculator. So many buttons. And then came the SATs where math was more letters than it was numbers. So I can sing all the math songs from Schoolhouse Rock and I can do them with choreography. And I can write essays until the cows come home but do not ask me to do much actual math beyond basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, basically bottom of the line accounting. So I don't know about you, but I found numbers boring. The outcomes were always predictable, and there was only one right answer, yet infinite wrong answers. I never did well with, you know, the jar, guessing how many jelly beans were in the jar. I never did well with figuring out how old someone is or estimating distance in miles instead of in minutes. So I am definitely more right-brained, more creative, more artistic. My grandparents used to laugh at me when I'd count on my fingers to add things my grandfather used to joke that I'd have to take my shoes off if I had to count past 10. So math is great, and it's important to make the world go round, but I am more than happy to leave the numbers to the people who understand the situations in which you would need to know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's about all I remember from geometry, from algebra. And that brings us to Jesus, who was arguably the most complicated walking math problem that there ever was. Two natures, yet 
three in one, all embodied in one human form. He's the already and the not yet, the always was, the still is, and the always will be. And I will bet you that that Pythagorean theorem is not going to help you figure that one out. But that is also why when we join Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, he's facing opposition. He's claiming to be something that people aren't willing to accept. Something they don't understand. Something that goes against what they already believe. He's doing things that are countercultural, that are butting up against the current political climate. And he's doing things that were downright not kosher according to civic and religious laws. Now, Jesus knew all that going into his ministry. He knew it was his calling to be subversive in order to replace the existing political and religious structures with something more focused on God. So the first thing he does in the chapter of Mark is to teach in the synagogue on the Sabbath, which that was a big no-no. And this caused people to question and to challenge Jesus's power and knowledge and his agency and vocation and even his family and Jesus is just appalled at their disbelief. But he moves on. He shakes the dust off and he moves on to continue teaching in villages around the area. So the part of this passage that I find really interesting is that he called his 12 disciples near to him. And then he sent them out in the surrounding area two by two, to cast out unclean spirits, to anoint folks, and to heal people. So why two by two? Well, if you've ever looked at biblical numerology, it is a fun journey far, far down the rabbit hole. So if you decide to explore it, take it with a grain of salt, don't get too caught up in it. But it is helpful for a few different reasons. So the the number two appears in the Bible more than 600 times in most English translations. And two is a number signifying union. And this is reflected in the idea of the union between Christ and the church as well as the union between two people in marriage. Two joining together and working as one. So the disciples being sent out two by two is significant, going all the way back to creation. Now regarding humans, we were not created to be lone beings, navigating this world in solitude. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to be partnered with someone for life. And if you're living a single lifestyle, either because you choose to or because you're widowed or whatever the reason, it doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. What I'm trying to say is that this means that we are created to exist in community. We were so not necessarily in pairs, but in community. We were meant to do ministry in community. We were meant to care for one another in the community. So let me give you an example. Take the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church USA, which is our denomination. The pastor is not the one who governs the church and makes all the decisions. The pastor is not a CEO or a president, or if, if you like nonprofit lingo better, the pastor is not an executive director. The session and the pastor lead together, 
side by side, neither lording power over the other, working together to discern God's will for the congregation. And then we throw the deacons into the mix and the session, the pastor and the deacons care for the congregation side by side, working together to discern the needs of the people that we are given to care for. So in the Presbyterian church, we like to follow this model. When we visit folks who are sick, we usually go in pairs. When we bring communion to those who are homebound or when we go out into the community, like into local assisted living places and offer worship there, our governing book of order that governs our denomination directs us to go in pairs. So if you've ever spent time in a Presbyterian church, you know that Presbyterians love committees. And that's another example. None of us is meant to toil endlessly doing the work of the church solo. Are you beginning to understand this notion of community yet? So all of that makes sense that Jesus would send the disciples out in pairs. And this is reminiscent of Noah leading the animals two by two. Well, the disciples brought the message of God out of the church into the community and to the people. Where they weren't wanted, and I'm sure there were places that said no thank you, Jesus told them to shake the dust off their feet and to just move on. So I'm going to issue you a challenge. I like to do that. So here's another challenge for you. Contact a friend this week or talk to your partner or call one of your kids or grandkids. Listen for an issue that's going on in their lives and then pray for them. Ask them to pray for you. Or if you're feeling really bold, you can pray with them in the moment. Find a fellow disciple and do some ministry together this week. And if the person you reach out to isn't open to this, shake the dust off your sandals and find someone else. You don't have to have the most eloquent words ever uttered to pray. You don't have to be an expert in a certain discipline to give of yourself. And you certainly don't need to understand college level algebra to do ministry. Thanks be to God. What you need is a heart for God, a willingness to try some things that might be a little uncomfortable, might be a little new. And you need an openness as to how the Spirit will bring you to a person who needs you. So you are one. Find your two. And minister to one another this week. One plus one equals ministry. And that's all you need. Amen.